Good day, mate. 40 here. So on Friday, we got the announcement of a special prosecutor for the Hunter Biden matter. Can't imagine that this is good news for the Democrats or for President Joe Biden. So what? Two, two months ago, it looked like there was going to be some uh, plea deal where Hunter Biden would just cop to a couple of misdemeanors and the whole thing would go away. All right. Doesn't look like that anymore let's get some commentary here from robert wright and mickey kaus people but if they can really show something like what you're saying then even if they can't show the money going to biden himself that should be kind of a little bit of a scandal right i mean that's pretty shady i think so i you know i think it, it, my line is it's it's uh impeachable but it doesn't mean i wouldn't vote for him under certain circumstances but i'm not um, sure it's I would almost say the opposite. It's, imp- it's, it's I'm not sure it's. Imp- okay, let's uh, start off. Say good uh, good morning to Duvid. Duvid, how are you this morning? Rokasham, thank God. Okay, great. Um, so while well, I just figure fiddle around with a couple of uh, technical things here on on my end, uh, talk to me about um, what's what's been going on with you since I spoke to you last. Um, I mean, personally, not that much. I, uh, I was actually recognized by the city of Detroit for uh, 10 years of, uh, chess coaching. So, uh, I guess that, that was nice on Thursday. There was a 20th year anniversary of the Detroit city chess club of which I've been a chess coach now for 10 years. And, uh, besides that, uh, you know, still doing my research, selling books, uh, but uh, not much advancement in my own personal streaming or life. Okay. And uh, Are you there, Luke? Met me have a microphone yeah, issues. I asked, have you gone back to Shul? No, I, di- I didn't go back. In fact, I went, uh, I told you I went for those two medical events. There's another medical event. Um, do you in like a to week the- for now and you know, M- michael came to my house friday night and we did the friday prayers and he like uh he was feeling really inspired he was like wanting to move to israel and make aliyah and uh i was thinking like okay like maybe i could bring him to the local young israel but honestly like i didn't even know i mean like i probably have to contact somebody or if i could just show up uh, saturday morning i know they have security or, uh, and it, it made me feel kind of weird about it because I mean, it's the nature of synagogue where I'm not actually sure I could bring my friend who's like trying to convert. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I understand that we've got uh, much tighter security measures in place. So it, you're touching on something that, uh, I've often reflected on, uh, when, when people embrace Orthodox Judaism as adults, either as converts or as Balei Tshuva, I've noticed that they are often seeking in Orthodox Judaism uh, things that Orthodox Judaism is not necessarily suited to primarily providing. They're, they're usually seeking, if they're not doing it for pragmatic reasons, they're, they're doing it to try to get a sense of meaning in their life, a sense of God in their life, but really they want to get a life where they like and respect themselves. And usually people who already like and respect themselves don't make a dramatic change like uh, joining Orthodox Judaism. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, Mika, I lived in New York for uh, um, a long time. I'm not sure, have, have you seen the Frida Weisel uh, YouTube page yet? The Satmir, uh, the Satmir tours of uh, Williamsburg. I'm not sure. I haven't paid attention. I'll put the link in the chat. I mean, it's not su- super interesting, but I say it's extremely different in New York than probably anywhere. Maybe, maybe L.A., but probably not L.A. because um, New York and in Israel, when you become Jewish, you, you're looking at a community that you're going to become a part of, and that community is large and powerful. So, like, you know, here in Metro Detroit, there, there's a few thousand Orthodox Jews, um, but, you know, they live in the poorest part of, uh, you know, at least the you know, Oakland County of where the Jews live. 
and if you joined the Jews, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be looking forward to becoming integrating part of the Orthodox community. So if you talk like someone like Michael who lives you know, like 45 minutes out into the suburb, doesn't have too much connection with Jews at all and almost zero connection with Orthodox Jews. It's more, you know, him like you're like you were talking like a personal identity thing that is connecting to Judaism and then a feel possibly towards Orthodoxy as opposed to if you were actually in um, New York City where, you know, you saw Hasidim, you saw Orthodox Jews or like Lakewood and or, or uh, you had some sort of connection to uh, Israel where you were would have been thinking about it from the beginning of an integration within some sort of uh, culture community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're touching there on something that I noticed also that uh, I noticed a lot of people want to be part of Orthodox Judaism, but they're simply not prepared to make the, the the sacrifices that are necessary to be a normal part of Orthodox Judaism. And so they often try to do it on the cheap by trying to get around the required sacrifices, such as you know moving to within walking distance of a synagogue. And then they, they are concerned that they don't fit in because they're not making the sacrifices necessary to fit in. But uh, there is a substantial sacrifice required to pull off a conversion to Orthodox Judaism, not just a conversion in form, not just passing through the process, but actually making it real in your life after you've passed through the, the process. Uh, any thoughts on the, the relatively large number of people, I think, who would love to be a part of Orthodox Judaism, but simply are not willing or not able to make the sacrifices necessary to be a part of Orthodox Judaism? Yeah, I mean, the vast majority of people don't even realize the sacrifices involved. And even like, you know, Misang, who successfully did it for many years, picked up, you know, multiple languages, lived a different life uh, you know, it, for per periods of my life, you know, basically completely cut ties with uh, my family, all my former friends and uh, connections. And, uh, you know, then I still largely failed. And, uh, you know, then if you did successfully find a marriage partner and have children, of trying to uh, raise your kids. So, I mean, if you find it interesting, I think this dichotomy of, if you look, maybe me or Michael, where um, I more just enjoy being an Orthodox Jew and interacting and as a life outlook of how I, how I do things. And the community part is more difficult because uh, I don't necessarily really feel like I fit in with a community or I'm a representative of um, a community. However, I like interacting with Gentiles and secular Jews and even fellow Orthodox Jews as an Orthodox Jew, um, but I never really integrated into the community as opposed to uh, integrating in the community. Like I know when I went into Israel, I was in Orsamak and uh, you have the cure of rabbis and versus uh, what they tell you uh, you know, versus my own perception, you know, where I saw like, I got to fit in with these Orthodox Jews, these Hasidic Jews, and like the gatekeeper approach where the Orthodox Jews are like the gatekeeper who are going to say whether you're really Jewish or not. And, uh, you know, Michael, maybe from his background, he's not really concerned with that. Like, he, you know, he knows that almost no one has even heard of these rabbis, uh, has met any of these rabbis, and he just enjoys interacting with his old family, his old friends, uh, new people he meets as a Jew and like well, I'm, you know like kind of like you when you were stream I watch you be like I'm an Orthodox Jew and like I would have watched you like you're not an Orthodox Jew no way um, you know like if you were an Orthodox Jew you you would, you would uh, you're doing all this wrong uh, but you know from your perspective you're like well you, you know, go back to the ghetto you know saying like I'm an Orthodox Jew and I'm going to keep on doing this um, versus trying to actually fit into the ghetto and you know sort of say I've tried to fit in the ghetto and I saw it's like okay I mean you got these rebbies you got these rabbis and you got to do whatever they tell you. You got to do all this stuff. You got to, uh, um, and I wouldn't say it's impossible because there are many people who succeed, but it's borderline impossible to, so to say, to convert and fit into um, Orthodox Judaism. And, but uh, you know, even here in Oak Park, Michigan, there's converts that, uh, I put it, the, you know, maybe a better way to express it, we, those who shun the outside world, so they shed their former identity and then take on a new identity within the confines of the Orthodox world, 
or there's those who convert and then use that as a new way to approach the outside world. And, and maybe you're uh, the latter where you, you didn't shed your old identity to hide within the confines of Orthodox Judaism. You put on like a new suit and now you're approaching the outside world with that new suit, that new identity on. Mm, so many topics you, you bring up there. Uh, so the, the most stable transition to Orthodox Judaism of which I've seen is the transition to Orthodox Judaism that seems to be primarily motivated by marriage, uh, by you've already established a relationship with someone who's an Orthodox Jew, and so to get married and to build a family together, you convert to Orthodox Judaism. In your experience, is this the most stable form of, most stable basis for entry into Orthodox Judaism? I mean, you must be talking L.A. because, like, I think that's extremely rare. I mean, even here in, like, Metro Detroit, there might only be a handful of examples because they're going to frown on that. So, like, if you're outside Orthodox Judaism, like, you know, you reform or conservative, you're not going to bother converting Orthodox for marriage. And if you're Orthodox, the chance that you actually... Uh, that's my phone ringing. Okay, go ahead. Uh, take I, I, it's that. not important. I just, so it won't ring um, the chance that you're actually going to be in a situation like that where you're um, you're going to be engaged to marry an Orthodox person. And, and the last hurdle is converting um, is almost non-existent. So, I mean, maybe in L.A. it's a, it's a different ballpark where you have all sorts of uh, your orthodoxy is on a much lower level where you have uh, your Orthodox Jews in relations with non-Jews and then they would, uh, you know, convert to uh make the family happy but that, yeah, i would say like you know you got a really weak orthodox community in la if that's the case there's something to what you say in that uh, the level of commitment to judaism like the level of commitment to christianity is considerably attenuated on the west coast compared to the east coast so i notice on the east coast uh, people have much stronger meaning the northeast not not so much florida but i notice in, in the northeast people have much stronger ethnic ties they have much stronger ties in general to their families. They have much stronger ties in general to their religion, to to their schools, to traditional forms of identity it seem to be much, much stronger. And so Judaism is, is much more rigorous, much more demanding from my experience on the northeast of the United States compared to the West Coast. What are the major patterns or genres that you've seen among people who convert to Orthodox Judaism and uh, pass through the process and seemingly pull it off? Um, well, just to go back before we, if, if you wanted to dwell on this, like, how, like, cause to me, it's unfathomable what you're saying. Like, how is it possible that people convert to Orthodox Judaism for marriage? Like, I can't even like fathom the pathway of like what like what does that look like how is it possible you're saying like there was an orthodox jew who was like dating a dating a shiksa and then like the only thing he needed was her to convert so they converted her yeah like, I it, mean, it's, it's almost unfathomable like like how does that even happen how could well how it could happens you, hundreds of times a year in the united states it's the the prime mover behind conversion to orthodox judaism because people primarily meet each other at, at work or if they're in a similar profession and so particularly modern Orthodox Jews are almost always in the professions such as lawyer, doctor, dentist, accountant. And so if you haven't you know, married by the time you're 22, 24, which is kind of normal in Orthodox Judaism, but get into your late 20s and you meet someone at work, all right, uh, the odds are, are pretty high that that person won't be Jewish. And so people fall in love and uh, Orthodox Jews are affected by the culture around them. And so falling in love is largely seen in the culture that surrounds us as the basis for, for getting married and forming a family. So yeah, I see this happening a lot with Orthodox Jews. I'm surprised that you consider it you know, virtually impossible. Yeah, I mean, certainly in New York City, they, I don't think that's ever happened like that because uh, I mean, the community is so large and there would be so many eyes upon a person that uh, I'm saying like there's hundreds of thousands of uh, Jewish girls that you could uh, you know always be set up with that uh, and uh, you know the the deline delineation of orthodoxy usually you know is not modern orthodox where you know people would be 
you know, having beards or Hasidic or, or clearly dressed as Jewish, where it wouldn't, uh, you couldn't have like a relationship with the, uh, you know, maybe if you're like in a modern Orthodox area or LA where very few people, uh, where there's a, a larger constituency of modern Orthodox than Orthodox, where the person's in the work world and, uh, you know, their romantic partner doesn't know that they're Jewish or how seriously they take their Jewishness. And uh, the relationship carries on for a while uh, to the point where they, you know, they, they'd consider getting married and they would need to convert. So like in, in Brooklyn or New York, uh, the differentiation would just be too strong. You know, so if you're, you're Orthodox, it would be obvious you're Orthodox. It would be obvious from the beginning that uh, it's not going to work, that you'd have to, you know, convert. And so, you know, the likelihood that you'd fall in love and then, and then find out that like, oh, you have to convert and that you wouldn't know that up front or that other people wouldn't know about it, uh, you know, right away that, uh, you know, so if you're I mean, even in Metro Detroit, but, uh, you know, so if you're in a romantic relationship with like a coworker, uh, your fellow Orthodox Jews would almost definitely know about that at the beginning and put a stop to it. Uh, you know, it, to uh, not allow it to reach that level. So I'm guessing it's more something like in LA that uh, just culturally would not be practical in New York. And that's why I say like, I can I can think of almost no cases like that uh, in my experience uh, in New York. And, and then I mean, if you wanted to respond or you want to say the pathways I saw. Okay, to, I'll, just, uh, uh, I'll just respond. So also what you often get is that someone falls in love with someone who he or she believes is Jewish and then finds out that they're not Jewish according to Orthodox law, even though the persons believe they're Jewish all their life because they grew up reform or conservative. So that happens. Also, many Balei Tshuva, all right, people who are not Orthodox uh, fall in love with someone who's not Jewish. And then along the way, they, the, the Jewish partner decides to become Orthodox and the, their non-Jewish partner decides to come along for the, for the ride. So feel free to respond to that. Otherwise, talk to me about the yeah, different so that, uh, that just, genres. The communities conversion. are too strong in Brooklyn for that to happen. Because like the differentiation between Jewish and Balchuva or you know, you think you might be Jewish, like in Brooklyn, like you got the rabbis, like everybody's cousins or went to school. So it's like you're Orthodox, you went to an Orthodox school and uh, you know, it's obvious like, you know, like, I mean, unless like there's a rare case of somehow like a person from one of these questionable backgrounds somehow got into and went to one of these orthodox schools so like your marriage pool would be from fellow people who went to these schools and uh if you're like a balchuva or someone who thinks you might be jewish there's so many rabbis all over the place that would have put you through the ringer i mean i'm and because i know that's what they went through with me like uh you know they wanted to know my family records they wanted to know my family ancestry and uh, I was put into a questionable category. And one of the reasons I was never applicable for marriage, because I was never able to conclusively um, demonstrate my, my uh, Jewishness for marriage standards within the Orthodox. So, you know, so I, I see in L.A. where it's completely different than Brooklyn, where you have, you know, just like a, a subculture of Orthodox Jews that run their own thing. In you know in LA, I could imagine that it's that much different. I'm not sure if you could imagine Brooklyn being that much different, where there is no path to what you're talking about. There is no path to a romantic relationship between a Jew and a non-Jew that could end in conversion, except for a person who went off the derrick. So if like a person went off the derrick, left the community, was living in a non-Jewish area, and then fell in love, maybe like in terms of like trying to make their family happy to convert. Or, uh, uh, but, but almost in none of those cases would the person return to you know, the mainstream Brooklyn Orthodox community. So, you know, like there, there are plenty of cases like that where people have a cousin or a brother who left the community and married, and maybe they went through now they're modern Orthodox and went through a conversion. But, like, if they came back into Brooklyn, um, they would be questioned, um, on their Judaism permanently. And I remember, like, in, in Bubov in various Hasidic yeshivas, um, even Bali Tshuva generally have to marry, the children of Bali Tshuva generally marry the children of other Bali Tshuva because uh, lineage is that important to people. 
that uh, that even like two or three generations later, you're like, oh, my granddad was a Balchuva, and uh, you, you know, like his Yichus, his lineage was questionable. That uh, that the the general community still does not want to intermarry or date with their children. So, like in LA, I could picture that it's that different. I'm not sure if you could picture in Brooklyn it being that different to the other extent. Yeah, I, I think we're we're probably both speaking out of our own experiences. So I doubt that. 50% of Orthodox Jews on the East Coast live lives that are as closely regulated and scrutinized by the rabbis as you describe. I think you're talking about more traditional, verging on Haredi communities of which you're more aware. I am mostly aware of West Coast forms of Orthodox Judaism, which are considered considerably watered down compared to uh, what you describe on the East Coast. Most uh, well, not most, but a large number of Orthodox Jews on the East Coast do not lead lives as regulated and scrutinized and as under the thumb of the rabbis as you describe. Most, or not not most, many Orthodox Jews on the East Coast, a considerable number, approximating 50%, you know, do not lead lives like this. Do you think I'm wrong? No, I think you're right. So I thought it was interesting just to highlight that and, like you know, said that, uh, you know, when I was... In Hasidic Brooklyn, where you know you actually have a Jewish neighborhood, where basically, I mean, we also talked about this in relation to uh, the difference in New York and multiculturalism, because you know the, it's not Jews among whites. There's almost no whites there, and you know the Jews are largely representative of the whites. Uh, but you know there, there's Hebrew letters on the signs, and uh, maybe half the people speak Yiddish as the first language, and a lot of these schools are. Yiddish schools and uh, maybe on the Upper West Side, you could be right. Like even on the Upper West Side where you have hundreds of thousands of Jews, um, still it's very common for them to take their yarmulke off, to use Anglo-sized names. And it could be even on the Upper West Side of Manhattan that it's closer to what Luke is saying than what I'm saying. But like I live in Hasidic Brooklyn and uh, you know, maybe it gets back to your, your next question about uh, what are the pathways to conversion. Wait, hang on, before we go there. So to fill and date, I, I think that's probably largely a modern Orthodox thing. So to fill and date is when you're going out with someone and you take your tefillin along because you expect to spend the night with the, with the woman. And so when you get up in the morning, you're going to want to put on your, your tefillin. So obviously there weren't a lot of tefillin dates in the Orthodox communities that you knew in New York. Yeah, when we talked about this many times, and I was saying the, the difference from like Orthodox, modern Orthodox to Haredi is when you reach the Haredi level, you have no personal autonomy. Um, you, you know, like if you miss Marev, like someone's going to be like, where was he? And, uh, and almost everybody you know, everybody you associate, you're going to already have to be off the derrick to have a level of personal autonomy. I don't know if that makes sense to you, like in sense like, oh, like, uh, you know, like if you were in the Haredi community, everybody would know all of your friends. You would not be able to conceal a single like friend that the community doesn't know about. And if you disappeared for a day or two, um, everybody would know it. It was like, oh, Luke, Luke wasn't in shul, you know, for the, the three times a day he's expected to be in shul. And it would be like, you know, topic every single person that, uh, you know, followed you or cared about you. Or, or your haters would like, you know, where, where, where was he? And uh, it's meant to protect about, uh, protect from the things that you're mentioning. And uh, I mean, we've discussed that level of personal autonomy and the level of completely giving up any personal autonomy. Yeah. And the, the other rejoinder I'd have, anyone who's spending time around non-Jews is going to be far more susceptible to falling in love with one, just like any woman who works is going to be much more vulnerable to having an affair than women who just stay home with, with the kids. So there are Haredi Jews who spend a great deal of their professional life around non-Jews, and so they're, they're much more vulnerable to falling in love with a non-Jewish woman than those who don't uh, spend a great deal of time around non-Jews. Is that fair? Well, no, no. I mean, because like in the Hasidic community, only adult male businessmen spend time around non-Jews and generally, that that would only be the case after they're married with children. So uh, there would be basically no possibility for fraternization, except for adult married men that already have children. And like generally in the Hasidic community, you don't enter the business world until you're married with children. 
Okay, so what are the different types of conversions to Orthodox Judaism that you have seen that appear to be somewhat successful? Um, so I'll give three general paths. One is the incremental path, maybe like yours, where it moves from reform to conservative to orthodox to even like Hasidic. And that could happen very rapidly or over a long period of time. You know, I mean, a person within a few months of uh, going to a reform temple could uh, come on to uh, ultra orthodoxy or could take uh, you know, many years or decades for, for that incremental process. Uh, the other is possibly people maybe michael is a case of that like independent spiritual seekers for whatever reason and maybe you're also somewhat a case like that before your incrementalism through like dennis prager or something but just people from whatever personal development largely outside of any connection to jews or the jewish community start to affiliate as a jew start to study judaism and then it could move on to the incremental process uh you know uh, like but but saying that it's a personal discovery process as opposed to a communal, um, like, uh, you know, you're in university and you start going to the Hillel house and then you start going to the reform Friday night prayers or, or, or things like that and get more into it uh, versus a person who makes their own personal discovery and think I'm a Jew even before they meet Jews. And then the third case would be more like you're saying, and there'd be a whole bunch of various pathways where it'd be direct connection with the Orthodox community where the however it came to be that a gentile has reached into the social circles of basically all orthodox jewish circles so you know whatever reason you know it could be party circuits it could be business um but uh, where you have or it could be a gentile who just happens to live in an orthodox area um but where the gentile is a minority among a, mi a majority of orthodox jews and decides to culturally make the switch to uh the other side so I, I would say those are the three major uh pathways and and uh i think you have a reasonable amount of all three of those and i, I would just add that those people who have led stable lives prior to conversion the most likely to continue on with orthodox judaism after their conversion those people have led chaotic lives prior to conversion are the most you know, likely to not be able to sustain a conversion to Orthodox Judaism. People who have experienced life within community and are pleased to live within the confines of, of any community are going to be much better suited to converting to Orthodox Judaism than those who don't. Those with a generally pro-social orientation are going to be much more suited to conversion to Orthodox Judaism. Also, you need to earn an above average amount of money. And so those people who were leading a professional life where they were earning above average money uh, prior to conversion, they're much more likely to be successful in a conversion to Orthodox Judaism than those who struggle to even earn an average amount of money. So people with better life skills, people who are more competent, uh, people who are more at ease with themselves and other people, people who earn money, who handle money responsibly, who end, handle alcohol responsibly, who handle the, the natural passions of life responsibly prior to conversion, much more likely to be able to continue on with a conversion to Orthodox Judaism after they've passed through the formal stages. So what happens when you convert to Orthodox Judaism is that uh, whatever's going on with you internally prior to the conversion or whatever your habits were with money, with the natural passions, with other people, with yourself, prior to conversion, those habits are just going to continue. They just may express themselves in different language and in different circumstances. But if you had a problem with the opposite sex prior to conversion, if you had a problem with anger or depression prior to conversion, those those problems are going to continue after your conversion. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, although, you know, a Hasidic friend, you say like normal in America is being able to hide your problems. And uh, you depends how normal you are. So like they like said, like if you're here in Metro Detroit um, and you come from the more higher social economic places uh, 
ortho converting to Orthodox Judaism, joining their community might be a downgrade. And I would probably guess it's like that in LA. So I'm guessing like where you are in LA, it, you know, it might be modern Orthodox. It might be relatively quite wealthy. And most of the people you know have college educations and secular careers that include respect from non-Jews. However, certainly today, I would almost guarantee that the actual rabbis who oversee Orthodox conversion, none of those people have a college degree and they're probably in the more ghettoized part of Los Angeles that you might be able to convert in your area be an Orthodox Jew, but you have to go to the ghettoized part of Orthodox Judaism, pass a bunch of rabbis that have no university uh, education and is in a lower social economic place than where you currently are residing and integrating with the with you know, the your your Jewish community. Yeah, that, you know, I've, I, yeah, I've never seen anyone convert to Orthodox Judaism and have a lifestyle downgrade. Uh, so what you've seen, I have not seen. Now in in Los Angeles, if you're converting to Orthodox Hollywood, can you convert in Hollywood, or you have to go? I don't know where the Orthodox community is, but I would assume that the rabbinic court that converts you is not in Hollywood. It's in, uh, you know, the mainstream black hat area of town. And, uh, you know, so if you're from Hollywood and you convert and uh, you decide to move to the black hat area of town, that's a downgrade. Well, the areas of town where the Jews live are not downgrades. There's Hancock Park and there's uh, Beverly Hills, basically, in those areas surrounding that. And then, then the, the valley, Valley Village in the San Fernando Valley. So these are all uh, where's relatively the upscale. Now, where's the, the rabbinic court headquartered? There, there, there's not one rabbinic court. It's not like Detroit. We've got at least uh, 12 conversion to Orthodox Judaism, but a din Jewish law courts in Los Angeles. Okay, so it may, may be different there, but uh, um, and, and also the, the you know, social economic. So I mean, relatively like, okay, in Metro Detroit, Oak Park is upper middle class neighborhood. Um, but it borders Detroit and relative to the Jewish community, um, Oak Park is the poorest Jewish neighborhood. Um, you know, if you looked at home values, maybe home values in Oak Park are like 150,000 on average in my neighborhood, uh, you know, now with inflation, let's say, you know, 200, 250,000 on average and further out in the suburbs, uh, you may be like half a million on average. And the Orthodox community is confined to the areas, you know, up to about Two hundred thousand dollars in home value. So, if you're coming from Detroit, where the average home value might be thirty thousand um, dollars, or outside of the suburbs, uh, but if you're coming from the better parts, social economic parts of the suburbs, a conversion to and I've seen it a handful of times that if you're from a nicer area of Metro Detroit and convert. Um, in order to live with the Orthodox Jewish community, you're going to have to make a social economic downgrade and then say in the black hat part of town um college education is not necessarily respected so like you know your part of town maybe all the jews are college educated however in uh, you know oak park uh maybe less than 10 percent of the jews are uh college educated and then certainly in brooklyn it'll be a huge differential uh you know like i lived in the five towns and like yeah so the, in new york like the long island the five towns where the average home value may be uh, even a million dollars, they have an Orthodox section, they have their own uh, conversion court. Um, but like, you know, if you're from the five towns and, uh, you, you know, grew up going to elite high schools and, you know, had your own car at 16 and were expected to go to good universities, uh, the cultural transition to the Orthodox uh, part of town would be huge because, uh, you know, almost none of those people would go to university most of those people would be relatively poor, uh, you, you know, like uh, you know, maybe even a third of them would be on government aid and uh, welfare programs. Uh, you, you know, they're like we've talked about this uh, many times, where you said in your your part of town you don't have beggars coming to shul, but like in the I Orthodox never, state, never, I never, ever, ever in a million years said we don't have beggars coming to shul. Of course, we have beggars coming to shul. But I mean, they don't come directly up and hit you up. Uh, yes, they come you're... directly up and hit you up while you're doubting. Okay, and that's even in... Uh, that's even in um, Beverly Hills. 
Yeah, so but by saying like the comparison to like the yeshiva part of town is probably tenfold. I like don't the, know about that because the beggars are smart, they go where the money is. Um well, I mean, it could be, but, but I mean they try to make it less welcome. So I mean even at the even at the the young Israel near my house, um, you know, they worked out a system where they're expected to go to the rabbi and the rabbi will give them a donation on behalf of the congregation as opposed to individually going up to people and at least here they've been able to maintain that system and uh, you know various places like in the five towns or something like that they'll, they'll have some sort of system where that you know call like a god by sadaka and so that uh um and i know my my parents were, were you know the cultural shock uh, but but even even at that level, like like the security, like I, I had an old friend from uh, Burl Park call me a few like a month ago, and he was telling me like yeah like I was telling him about security and like you know all the shuls like security guards, and he said like in in the Hasidic uh, parts of uh, Brooklyn, uh, the synagogues still have open doors. You know like you could just uh, you know, walk in open doors to any synagogue, and so that you know it it makes it. Uh, but I mean we were making the point about a downgrade. And so most converts who convert to Judaism is an upgrade in their social economic status. Uh, if but there well, are in, cases in your where experience. To Judaism would be uh, would be a downgrade in their social economic status. Yeah, in in my experience, uh, most uh, conversions to Orthodox Judaism in Los Angeles are not a downgrade because most people who live in Los Angeles who are middle class are upwardly mobile. Those who are downwardly mobile move move from California because it's so competitive and expensive. But uh, let me move on to a slightly different topic. Uh, one of the least stable bases that I've noticed that uh, leads people to convert to Orthodox Judaism is an experience with the light or an experience with God, some kind of transcendental experience such as through meditation or drugs or some other gift where people are given a, an experience of the infinite and this is, I think, a very common basis for conversion to Christianity. It's not usually a stable basis for a conversion to Orthodox Judaism. Uh, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I was meaning to mention that before we got uh, um, off on that uh, you know, side tangent uh, of, and maybe Michael would be a case of someone that feels like, I'm Jewish, I don't need these rabbis to convert me. Like, I know I'm a Jew, and that's their own personal identity they've adapted and i don't know if you felt like that where you know at some point you you know when you I mean, people watch you know your story with your uh your chronic fatigue syndrome and you woke up one day and just like i'm a jew and um you didn't feel like you needed gatekeepers within the jewish community to affirm it um or that wasn't your case but uh, you know the, the, you do have a strong element of people that uh, they're just like I'm a Jew. I don't need any uh, you know Jews or rabbinic court to affirm it. And those people probably have a harder time succeeding. Although it might be the majority of people who attempt to convert to Orthodox Judaism are these people who feel like that, where where they just whatever reason determine that they're Jewish, and it bothers them the authority structure that they have to go through as a person who you know I want to be a Jew. And I'm willing to do whatever these rabbis tell me it takes to become a Jew. Right. So I never thought that uh, becoming Jewish was just something that I could do autonomously. So I've always understood that my identity is something that is, I would like to think I always understood this, is something that's jointly created. It's virtually impossible to sustain a personal identity that everybody around you denies <laughs> and degrades and, and denigrates. So anyone who tries to pull that off it's it's it verges on the impossible if you're not getting any support for it we can really only sustain identities including jewish if they are supported by a, a community by people we need we need other people uh let me Would you agree with my estimate the majority of converts are probably of the a type that think that they're jewish and don't need to convert and that's why they don't make it or, or you don't think that uh, that's the majority of converts well, or, or, wait, 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 if we, hang on, hang on, hang on. If we're just talking about converts to Orthodox Judaism, then by definition, if they don't make it, they're not converts in this conversation. So yes, those so people... Attempty, attempty converts, that, the, that maybe even half of attempty converts are people that have just decided that they're Jewish and don't 
really want to uh, respect the conversion process, but that's actually the majority, and that's why the majority failed. I, yeah, I think there there are a lot of people like that, and they don't really matter to the Orthodox Jewish community because they get weeded out uh, fairly ruthlessly. They're not able to sustain their their illusion for very long. Yeah, but from a Chabad perspective, they get weeded out of the Orthodox community, but usually those people stick around, and usually those people will loose, loosely befriend Jews on the exterior of the community and will still possibly the rest of their life or for large periods of time present themselves as Jewish to non-Jews. And I mean, it's an identity. So it could be there'd be a crash in identity where the person's like, I'm Jewish, I woke up, I'm Jewish. And they might go with that for like 10 years and then they just change their mind. Um, or sometimes they'll die like that, but uh, they might get weeded out of the Orthodox community, but you you know, they don't disappear. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. And there's a tremendous amount of fluidity in identity in America today, which even affects both Orthodox Jews and those who wish to be Orthodox Jews. So I've known Orthodox Jews, uh, I think, I think she, one in particular I'm thinking of right now, I think she was born Jewish, uh, became Orthodox for marriage. Then when her marriage ended, she went off and uh, married a, a Mormon in, and lived in Utah. Another woman converted uh, to Orthodox Judaism, uh, got married to a Jewish man. They they had Jewish kids, but then they got a divorce when the kids became adults, and then she completely left everything behind. So th there's a yeah tremendous fluidity in identity, particularly those who are more modern and more associated with the general American society compared to those in Haredi forms of Judaism. What? Well, when you said that, it made me think of an interesting point, and I would say that I would guess that very few people want to become Orthodox Jews. They just see Orthodox Judaism as the gatekeeping to legitimate con uh, conversion, and they might go through it for seeking legitimacy of the conversion, and uh, and then see that they they've passed the level they're 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 Jew now according to Orthodox standards, but they don't necessarily and and. I'm not sure in LA, like, uh, I mean, certainly now I, I would guess less likely maybe when you converted modern Orthodox Jews had more power. Uh, but you know, I think in the last few years, they've really hollowed out the uh, modern Orthodox conversion process. And if you did want to convert, you would have to get through the yeshivish Orthodox conversion process, and then you could become modern Orthodox. But the actual rabbis who would convert you uh, would not be modern Orthodox, certainly Metro Detroit, maybe in LA, they still have a few uh, do they have like a modern Orthodox uh, bed bet in that can do conversions? Yes, but you're, you're right that the Haredi are steadily taking over Jewish life in, in America and in Israel, that they are increasingly effect, effective at flexing their power and getting what they want. So, I mean, you could still be like, you could still, um, you know, so to say, like, I think you were more Orthodox, like you did Black Hat Judaism for a few years. Yeah. But as I've told you many times, I'm not going to get into the, the weeds and the details of much of my Orthodox experience. But I was saying that, you, yeah. so, so to say you had to pass those gatekeepers in order to get into the modern Orthodox community. So it wasn't, you didn't want to be, maybe you did at the time, but like you wanted to, so to say, be a modern Orthodox Jew, but you had to pass the gatekeepers of black hat Orthodox. Right. You, you keep wanting to bring it back to me. Every time we have a discussion, you keep wanting to bring it back well, I, okay, to my pers to, personal to life, and I'm, I'm not going to go there. So but, I, I, I put my I, own personal welfare. Very few people want to be black hat Orthodox Jews. It's just that they're the gatekeepers for uh, conversion. So when the person's goal is to pass the gatekeepers and then be Jewish at their own level, and they just see like what you know, whatever reason uh, you know, maybe they distaste it uh, even after their conversion, or 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 not that they say these guys are the gatekeepers. They have to pass through the gatekeepers, and then they could be Jewish at their own level, like most Jews. And and so you know, I would say very few people who convert actually want to be part of the ultra orthodox community. They just want to pass those gatekeepers. There's something to that, but I think there's even more to. There's a large number of Orthodox Jews who would love to be modern Orthodox, but they simply can't afford it. And so they, they choose other forms of Orthodox Judaism, 
simply because they cannot afford the expense of unorthodox life. It costs about half as much to send your kids to a traditional Orthodox Jewish school than to a modern Orthodox Jewish school. Yeah, so I, I guess that send send your kids to a modern Orthodox Jewish high school tuition without without financial aid is going to run you over forty thousand dollars a year. But you can send often send your kids to a traditional Orthodox high school for twenty thousand a year. Yeah, when we discussed this in the past, you know, I mentioned I did food stamps, and when I first got to Burl Park and it was integrating into the Hasidic community, um, a lot of the people advising me told me I should uh, apply for um, minimally food stamps and maybe like welfare or or Medicaid, and I, you know, I had too much pride; I didn't want to do that. Uh, but uh, you know, even the rabbis at the time that was like, okay, like you got to get on food stamps, and uh, you know, whatever government programs you're eligible for. And I ended up working and ended up, uh, you know, uh, I didn't need to do that, but I ended up working for the person that uh, filled out the forms uh, to do that. And so, the, yeah, so if you're in the, if you make it into the Orthodox community, um, you could live on charity and, uh, you know, government programs and the schools. So even if you have no money um, in, in, you're going to, your kids are going to be able to go to the Orthodox school, the modern Orthodox in Metro Detroit is small enough that I think actually a lot of the converts <clears throat> do end up going to the modern Orthodox school, <clears throat> but it could be a unique situation where there's such a small modern Orthodox community compared to the Orthodox community that there's excess funding um, and scholarship programs to allow the handful of kids of converts from the Black Hat community to go to the modern Orthodox school. Uh, but like in New York or LA, where you probably have modern Orthodox schools that cost like twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, it would be a completely different, uh, you know, ballpark, and uh, they're not necessarily going to have sympathy on you because you converted to Judaism to give your kid uh, a scholarship, and then also, you know, like you're probably among elites that uh, you, you know, like they went to good universities and have professional careers, and uh, you know, just uh, allowing somebody to get a scholarship to their school because they successfully converted to Orthodox Judaism, uh, you know, would not be uh, conducive to. Uh, their children's success. Yeah, so here's another maladaptive thing that I see going on by many people who want to convert to Orthodox Judaism is that they have delusions about the nature of Orthodox Jews. They, they, <laughs> they frequently assume that most Orthodox Jews are close to God. And uh, the reality is that Orthodox Jews are about as susceptible to many of the problems that plague people, you know, outside of Orthodox Judaism. So just knowing that someone's an Orthodox Jew doesn't mean that they're more likely to be nice, that they're more likely to be honest, honest in business, doesn't mean that they're you know, less likely to try to sexually take advantage of you or to financially take advantage of you. So here's a very common trajectory I see people become attracted to Orthodox Judaism because they have all sorts of delusions about the nature of Orthodox Jews, then when they encounter the reality of Orthodox Jews, and my experience of Orthodox Jews is not universal, but my experience of Orthodox Jews is that they are no more likely to be honest, decent, uh, trustworthy, and non-predatory as people who are not Orthodox Jews. So when they finally start repeatedly getting humiliated and taking advantage of uh, because of their naivete about Orthodox Jews, they then lose lose their enthusiasm, lose their faith in Orthodox Judaism. They become disillusioned and uh, either drop out of the pursuit of Orthodox Judaism or completely drop out of Judaism altogether. Any thoughts on this phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And, and we've talked about that uh, you know, many times um, that... Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's unfortunate, and uh, you know, like I, I was, you know, somewhat naive in Brooklyn. Although, yeah, I'm from Detroit, and a little street savvy too. But, but uh, you know, you certainly you may not expect uh, your people to scam, scam you, steal you, uh, or uh, you know, even to, you know, God forbid, sexual molestation or anything. People are people, and uh, if you have an idealistic view of Jews, uh, they're still just people, and you will be susceptible to. Um, to that, but I mean, maybe bring it back because we've talked about this in the past about modern orthodoxy is really like 
somewhat like an elite status, largely due to the social economic structure of America, because generally modern Orthodox Jews exist in upper middle class neighborhoods. And on both levels, like modern orthodoxy is the best of both worlds hypothesis. And just on like a secular non-Jewish level, the, uh, you know, the, the ability to be modern, you basically have to be upper middle class, successful, professional, earning, you know, like uh, near $100,000 a year, which, uh, you, you know, let alone generally modern Orthodox Jews on a Jewish level need to be able to be to uh, subsist and live in a black hat Orthodox community should they need to that like, okay, modern Orthodox Jews might not agree with it, but like almost all modern Orthodox Jews, if they needed to, could go into the black hat section of, of town and participate and live that lifestyle also. So it's it's really you know, near like, a, if you want to use the word elite, but it's a very difficult status to reach because you have to achieve excellence in two realms and especially the excellence in the secular realm that is beyond the reach of um you know, most Orthodox Jews and certainly most uh, most converts that uh, you're going to be expected to convert to Orthodox Judaism and pick up all this stuff and also to become a successful uh, you know, professional in the secular world is near impossible. Well, it's certainly challenging and it, it winnows out you know the, the numbers of people who can keep up such a challenging way of life. So we've often spoken on this show about the book, Virtually You, The Dangerous Powers of the E-Personality. So just to recap those basic points, that there is a compulsive nature of a lot of people's internet use that can be compared to obsessive compulsive disorder. There's often a euphoric high to going online. And we often develop exaggerated personality traits from our online performances. So we often tend to become uh, grandiose. We often tend to become more impulsive in our online personas. We often tend to develop an exaggerated sense of our own abilities. We often share dark things that we wouldn't share if we were getting visual cues from the people we talk up to. And so often this new somewhat pathological e-personality then feeds back into our regular self and damages our real life relationships. Uh, would you agree, Duvid, that for, for the live streamers we've known, uh, a, a large number of them have seem to have developed increasingly negative character traits that can be probably ascribed in part to their live streaming. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, you know, like Adam Green like messaged me. He's like, "Who's who's this guy? Like Ultra T?" And I said, "Like, you know, like <laughs> I don't know." I mean, but like, you know, like it's like he's been trolling me for like five years now. And then thinking like my own chat, you know, like. You know, I, I was even joking uh, to another streamer saying, like, your imaginary friends, like, mm -hmm. you know, these are not people in your chat are really just your imaginary friends. They don't like I mean, they exist to some extent, uh, but, you know, to some extent, they, they don't really exist. And, uh, you know, because I also stream chess, there's a certain element of you being really good at chess and people might watch and play chess, although like a lot of people are anonymous, too. And, yeah, they're just an, uh, imaginary friends. And there is basically impossible to convert those into real life and that's why i've let my viewership go down because like do i really want to have long-term relationship with imaginary friends and uh and then i could see like well if i'm gonna say like you, you know like uh you gotta tell me who you are you gotta dax yourself to me then uh you know people don't want to do that because i got you know, like a wide variety of uh people that don't necessarily like uh, the other type people that view my programming and so it's like well i don't mind telling you who i am but uh, i don't want uh, other people it, it actually goes back to when i was in hasidic brooklyn i had a lot of hasidic friends and they didn't mind being friends with me but they didn't want their other hasidic friends to know that they were friends with me or they didn't want to be you know my other hasidic friends for me like you know mention them to them because it wouldn't have fit their overall uh self-perception of their identity so like on the streaming level um yeah i mean it's a it's a fake personality that most people have developed and you know to think okay like i mean you know god forbid you got gunner in the chat or something like that you know, like five years now like uh um i mean he's got identity issues i'm not you know like a psychoanalyze i'm saying anything good or bad but uh you know think like you know god forbid 
like, do I really want to be in a non in chats for like a uh, few decades? And, uh, and do I really want to have long term relationships with uh, imaginary friends? Okay, I want to get back to this topic. But I, I just suddenly flash back to something that you said at the beginning of today's stream that you've often brought up and just ask you a question about you, you mentioned how the rabbis and the traditional Jewish communities that you're a part of looked at you with a great deal of skepticism due to you having one non-Jewish parent, and that made it more difficult for you to find a shidduch, a, a match, a, a marriage in traditional Orthodox Judaism. So here's my open-ended question. Is, there, is it easier for you to blame your, your bachelorhood in particular and other life problems in general on the status of having a non-Jewish parent and the power structures reactions to that, uh, as opposed to um, not having something like that to blame problems on? Um, I don't necessarily blame it, but I mean, certainly it was an important factor in that because, you know, we've been talking about a lot the difference between modern orthodoxy and Haredism. So like among the Haredi, it was just kind of accepted that I would marry someone like myself, that it was just like a non-issue. Like, of course, you're not going to marry within our community. It's just not going to happen. Like it, it doesn't happen. We don't do that. And, and, you know, even like my local modern orthodox community, you know, generally they're like, your mother's Jewish, you're hundred percent Jewish. Um, but uh, the difference in Haredi culture, it was just like a given that I would not be able to marry within their community. And, and at best, I would marry someone else that uh, you know, tried to integrate in their community like myself. And they had people like that. So like in a large, you know, Hasidic community. Wait, wait, that wasn't, this is, wasn't my question. I was just asking, do you get a psychic payoff to having a ready-made narrative that explains your, your problems and difficulties and failures in life? No, no, I don't, I don't consider it like a, excuse or, or reason my i think my my status of uh with judaism is one of the you know the, the larger reasons i haven't been able to successfully marry and uh that would go across the board like you know saying like uh you know if i'm gonna marry a non-jew uh then you know what what's with my jewish status and i never you know kind of like a failed balchuva so, uh, I mean, some some extent, you, like if I just jumped in and wanted to get married, it might have been a good excuse for me to uh, avoid dating and avoid getting married was my kind of like failed Jewish status that, uh, but I don't necessarily, it probably on the other end that I've used it as an excuse to not date and not get married, as opposed to a personal excuse I give myself for for blaming Judaism for being single. So I'll give you, I've got my own, you know, ready, handy narratives about failures. So if someone's asked me, hey, you know, Luke, you're 57, you, you have some abilities, why have you never married? I've got a ready-made narrative. I'll just say, unfortunately, I've been vegetarian my whole life. And until two years ago, I've had horrible health. So there's my like ready-made narrative that, that explains my failures. It's much easier for me to have that ready-made narrative, just ready to go, ready to hand off to anyone who asks rather than say uh, it's a result of, you know, who I am and my own poor choices and my own poor uh, character. So you've sent me links about, I think, narrative therapy. Uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts that you want to share on, on the relief that uh, you may get or other people may get from having a ready-made narrative ready to go that explains, you know, most or all of one's failures in life? Yeah, well, with narrative identity is a psychological theory of identity, and then based on that, there's a specific type of psychotherapy that's narrative therapy. So, like, narrative identity is, I don't think it's controversial, it's one of the main theories of identity in psychology, and if you prescribe to that, therapy, to that uh, school of identity, then there would be a specific uh, therapy based on that. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm like you. So people ask me like, why are you not married generally? You know, or you know, a lot of people even assume I'm married or, or you ask me about my children. And you know, so I never found the right woman. 
and I'm kind of eccentric and it was uh, you know, very difficult for me to find the right woman. And if they ask me more about that, uh, you know, my, my relationship to Judaism would just be one of the reasons that uh, that I'm eccentric. Um, but I'm not sure if you want to go. Well, do you get relief from having like a ready-made explanation, a, a ready-made narrative to offer people who ask, you know, embarrassing personal questions like this? Well, I don't know if it's relief. I mean, like, I, I put like narrative is not like an excuse. Narrative is a, a factual part of identity. My identity is my narrative. And saying like, I am the person who went to Israel at 18 and uh, became ultra Orthodox and you know, all these various things. That's the factual that you, know, you there, as opposed to, uh, I mean, there's role identity theory and then there might be trait identity theory to say that my identity is a set of characteristics that are defining of me um, as opposed to my identity is based off of my life story. And well, yeah, so but I don't... You, you keep wanting to abstract away from the, the more personal question. If you don't want to answer the personal question, that, that's fine. But uh, what, do you, what do you do when people ask you embarrassing questions, you know, bringing to light things that you're not thrilled about? I, I usually use self-deprecating humor. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that's kind of what you're doing also. But, but uh, you know, someone does press me. I'll just say something self-deprecating. And, and, and if they respond on it. I, I might go, you know, like, uh, you know, if I see that they're, they kind of, uh, you know, are taking the attitude that, uh, well, what, what's wrong with you? Like, there's obviously something wrong with you. And then, you know, they're just trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Then I'll just use some sort of, uh, you know, self-deprecating form of humor to try to give them, uh, some bit of embarrassing personal information about myself where that could, you know, make them understand like, oh, there is something wrong with you. And that explains why you are who you are. And uh, if that's kind of what you think you're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let, let me just keep <laughs> drilling here, kind of like a dentist on a sore tooth. But uh, would you agree with me that w one of the greatest resources you can have is to have you know, a valid basis for liking and respecting yourself? Yeah, I mean, there's healthy uh, realism. And, and you know that's part of narrative identity and the dissonance between the false narrative that I feed myself or, or it could be a distorted negative narrative uh, versus uh, you know so to say the the actual true narrative of who you are and why you became the way you are and uh, you know so narrative therapy would try to work out something like that like who is the real you what are the false narratives you've built built up versus the objective life experience you have what is the narrative that you portray to other people and why does that cause us to get into problems and in terms of like if you know you wanted you know, maybe me and you you know the the biggest fault anyone would you know, basically say like well you're both old bachelors like there must obviously be something wrong with you that you've both you know that we've both failed in uh you know one of the most fundamental things of what it means to be a man and in some sort of like narrative therapy you know, to say well what's your narrative what's your story that leads to you being here today and if it's like you know we're focusing on this failure that we both admit that we both have failed to build up uh families um i've never seen a narrative therapist i don't know how they would deal deal with it like i showed you that mcadams book just to show you that there was a thing and i thought you'd find it interesting i don't know if uh, i don't even know of any like local people who do narrative therapy or how they'd go about it yeah, so uh, for me, one of the advantages of uh, live streaming and having to interact with strangers is that you know strangers will find it easier to give you honest feedback or to ask you know honest questions than than uh, people you know face to face. And also, one of the advantages of getting older is that we can get better at writing or having in our head some kind of narrative for our life that enables us to feel some kind of valid self-respect and self-regard. Do, do you agree that getting older makes it easier to form a narrative? I mean, what do you do in your own head when painful things come up for you and you're kind of wrestling or uncomfortable with, you know, some part of your life? Have you found as you've aged, you become better at developing some kind of a coping narrative about why you are where you are where you are in life or if you found benefit from 
the sometimes brutal exchange with strangers online about the state of your life and any impetus that that may have provided for developing a, a narrative of your life that works for you? Look, I have definitely overanalyzed this and researched it and thought about it uh, you know, probably more than most people. So I largely accept that it's beyond my knowledge level that, you know, like the multiple truth hypothesis, that there's some theoretically like objective narrative or who I am. And then I have multiple possible narratives that explain me. And then there's other people, including you know, my, my family and loved ones, people who've known me. Uh, how people perceive me that have alternative narratives. Uh, you verse we were talking like like truth and the correspondence view of truth. So you know if you're gonna say theoretically there's one truth, one narrative that truly corresponds to who I am, versus saying there's elements of truth in all the various narratives, and like a role identity that uh, depending on the situation I might fall into a role. And and you know we've been talking long enough that I I'm more on the depressive side. Maybe you're on the more happy side so i could accept kind of like self-deprecating situations of uh you know just like oh, okay maybe, maybe i'm messed up uh you know, maybe no one does like me and uh you know so i might even dwell too much on narratives like that and, and you might have the opposite issue where uh you're you're focusing on overly positive narratives yeah i can't live stream really effectively unless i'm in the middle of some kind of coherent, at least for me anyway, narrative of my life that enables me to like and respect myself. So often when you don't see me live streaming or hardly live streaming for, for weeks on end, it's because my narrative of myself has has blown up. <laughs> and so there were years where I hardly made any YouTube videos between 2012 and 2014 because I couldn't, I couldn't sustain a, a positive sufficiently positive and respectworthy narrative of my life that would enable me to come online and to you know, bear my soul, so to speak. So does any of that ring true for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, live streaming definitely blew up my narrative. And you just mentioned like, you know, Gunner in the chat or something like that. You know, just to have like kind of like consistent negative feedback or, or trolling and you know like for years you just like anything i do like like that's a lie that's not true um is much more in your face than reality like you could people might be thinking that like i was saying like you know i went to the local shul and it's like well you know i might have a fear factor that's what people are thinking but no one said that no one treated me uh you know poorly but uh you know streaming like people are definitely you know critical even like uh um you know i mean gunner like even halsey if you say like you know like rejecting that i'm jewish like i like i lied i made up going to israel i made up studying yeshiva and i could see that like i could see like you know probably i walk around and think you're not a real jew you didn't really study in israel or or something like that and there's probably people thinking that but the, you know I, i've never get, been confronted on that but like the internet i would say it's almost like always every time i present myself like is always like you're not really jewish you didn't really you know do these things and uh that's what led me to my uh my research and so you're different because you're streaming i mean you're, you're similar to me in some ways but your streaming is also a lot about you and you tell a lot of personal stories as opposed to my streaming is much less about me and i'm just the guy who's like doing research sharing some interesting things that uh you know i'm thinking about and saying like i mean certainly a large part of your streaming is that also but uh you know generally when i stream it's not about me at all and just like i'll be talking about this topic and uh and then occasionally like I'll, I'll throw in like a personal story a little information uh about myself and then it's more a question of like establishing expertise and and uh you know for the audience and it, that's still difficult i still don't have a narrative where like half the people you know who watch my own stuff is like you don't know what you're talking about i don't even know what i'm watching you and then we're like well, well well then stop watching and that's why i'm down to just like a handful of viewers because i wasn't able to really come up with a narrative that made sense to myself and um and the viewers so you know like maybe constantly trying to reinvent myself but like you know god forbid i'm an old man uh you know can't really constantly be reinventing myself so um you know, it's okay kinda... let me let me jump in um so i was just reading an essay in the london review of books uh it's a book review 
by Laurent Ballant, the late Laurent Ballant, on the inconvenience of other people, and talks about the, the dangers of a- attaching or getting to know or introducing other people into your life, that it's, it always comes with it frictions and frustrations and inconvenience. So why is it so hard to live with other people? And this is talking about real life interactions. And here's, here's the challenge, knowing someone and being known by somebody brings a threatened inconvenience. It means the eruption. So an eruption is something that comes out, like a volcano is an eruption. An eruption is when something comes in. So when you are known by somebody, when you bring someone into your life, there's a threatened eruption of someone else comes into your fantasy of having a coherent self, that that they can reveal things to you that can blow up your own fantasy of having a coherent self, your own fantasy of a coherent narrative for your life. Is there anything there that you want to comment on? I think that's the point I was making that I've accepted that I don't have a coherent self. Um, And maybe before I started streaming, I did think I had a coherent self. And, uh, you know, that's why, you know, I started my research or came up with my multiple truth hypothesis. I'm constantly studying psychology. I mentioned like narrative identity, role identity. I think that's in line with the best knowledge of experts on the topic is that, uh, you know, the, this concept of coherent self uh, does not correspond to reality. Okay, so let me read to you some notes I made on how live streaming can make you a better man. Frequently it makes people worse, but here are some ways that it can make you better. It can teach you the importance of taking responsibility for your words. Because if you say things about people online, it will frequently get back to them. So you either have to stand behind your words or you need to apologize for them. So this this accountability that uh, should accompany honorable live streaming is a method of becoming a a better man. Any thoughts? Yeah, I would definitely say like something that was never part of my life but now I feel competent to like public speaking. I think I could do public speaking now. And I, I learned that from streaming and uh, you know, the ability to get the negative feedback that you're unlikely to actually get uh, in real life. Um, you know, certainly part of streaming could make you a, a better man. And then also uh, you know, why, why I first started streaming was topically that I just wanted to have conversations about the type topics that very rarely can I find a setting or a space of time where a group of people would discuss this topic? Uh, but online, I was able to uh, find people interested in the same topic and then have hours and hours of conversation just on the given area of uh, interest. Okay, great. And, Go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah, and then even that also would relate to the negative feedback because, uh, you know, once you're you know, so like, you know, just me and you are talking about Judaism, you know, people are going to, you know, you're out there and you might get positive feedback and that uh, works to the negative feedback to like, you don't know what you're talking about or that's not right. And it doesn't always have to be like uh, um, egoistic. Uh, you know, sometimes you could gather expertise, like, you know, we're just saying you're just talking about a topic and then all of a sudden you have the ability to talk to uh, some of the biggest experts in the world on the topic due to the power of uh, the internet. And due to the, you know the fact that most people in real life don't talk about uh, you know don't get together just to discuss these narrow topics, and that the big experts on the field who uh, specialize in talking about these narrow topics are likely to be much more likely to be willing to join your internet circle, especially if it's dedicated to uh, you know, their, their narrow topic of expertise. So I often say that people. Sh- should normally get most of their meaning and purpose in life from their family, extended family, uh, friends, community, uh, profession, and, and hobbies. But there are people like me and like you who will, will just go out of our minds with too extended a conversation on like normal things like food and, and drink and uh, raising kids and like the, the, the mundane topics that seem to dominate most conversations, I think would drive people like you and me crazy, at least they drive me crazy after a time. I know in Orthodox Judaism that uh, frequently Orthodox Jews can spend hours talking about food and drink, and that just drives me out of my mind. So 
for me to to feel uh, uh, that I have a life filled with meaning, I have to constantly be seeking truth about the the wider world. Uh, I assume that's the same for you. Yeah, and I hate repetitive conversations. So even like you would say, most people like you if you're talking like Orthodox Jewish circles where they're talking about that not only do they talk about it for hours but they're actually repetitive conversations and like if you have sabbath with the same people over years you know in, in like you, you say like objectively we've had basically this exact same conversation 10 times that's why sometimes i'll pop in the chat on the stream and i'll, and I'll joke like is this a repeat uh you know like if you had like babs or brundle on or something and there's some form of like role identity of comfortability within a conversation where there's a comfortability to just repeat conversations and maybe the people don't realize they're repeating the conversation but i think on some level uh they do and there's just the comfortability factor in doing that so i want new information and i think the other day you were talking about you're just the heuristic like you could assume like you, your mom your best friend your worst enemy is watching and I quit back like, no, my mom does has no interest in these topics. And you know, if you're talking about a given topic, um, your best friend, your family members uh, just aren't interested. They're not going to watch. Like, you know, if you, if you did as you know, like I gave the example like chess playing and uh, you know, like maybe someone like, OK, like you're going to learn how to play chess just for me because it's really important to me. And then maybe you'd become a chess player. But like, don't I mean generally you could have a long-term friendship and just be like, oh, he really enjoys this and I've never done it. And so whenever he does it, like I just tune out, it's not interesting to me. And so I think that's also you know, part of streaming. My dad plays internet chess sometimes and my mom still doesn't even know how to play the game. Um, so I think that's could be normal and healthy in the internet. You know, the, the internet just is a tool like chat GPT. It's just a tool that could be positive or negative and that could be one of the positive uh, aspects of it. Uh, another possible positive aspect of live streaming is that I find it's the most demanding thing that I typically do. I get more drained from live streaming than almost anything else except for the most intense cognitive labor. But uh, overall, I find live streaming with its multiple cognitive loads, such as checking sound quality, visual quality, uh, preparing topics to discuss, queuing up uh, things to play, uh, interacting with, with the, the chat, noticing how the stream is flowing over multiple platforms at once, that it's a real cognitive and emotional workout. Uh, do, do you find it such a, an intense workout? How would you place it compared to other tests in your life? Yeah, definitely. Although I would, what I mentioned, public speaking, and, and, and I'm not sure if you ever were able to move into public speaking, but I would assume public speaking is more demanding and yeah, you know, really, it's only happened at like the Hare Krishna temple. But I remember you know, like a few times where I spoke in front of everybody, you know, even just briefly, and they had like the microphone, the sound system. There might have been a pretty big crowd, like 50 to 100 people. And uh, even if it was like open mic or topical where people were just introducing themselves. And when uh, you know, you know, like you speak into the microphone and you hear your voice echoing through the whole hall and, uh, you know, it's loud. Um, so I'm not sure if you have any experience in public speaking, but like, or if you'd agree with me that presumably public speaking is even more demanding. Yeah, I've, I've had, you know, my share of, uh, public speaking experience. I've even been the scholar in residence at one synagogue in Los Angeles. Uh, let me go back to my blog post here on ways that, uh, live you have a memory of that feel like when you first speak in the yeah, microphone, it's very, in, well, it's, very it's, 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 uh, it's very intense, but I find this is similar to public speaking. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that public speaking is more demanding than, than this. I'd say it's equally demanding because this is a form of public speaking. So here's my next point on how live streaming can make you a better man. You get a regular test for prioritizing your own well-being or the well-being of your online production. So do you put the priority on your real self or on your internet self? So the more priority you put on your e-personality, usually the more off track you get in life. So it's a constant stimulus that then immediately spits out feedback about your direction in life. So any thoughts on live streaming as a test for your ability to conduct self-care or to disregard your self-care in your pursuit of a virtual personality? Yeah, it might be like a caveat of, 
actually having an audience because like you know i mean thank god you were able to build up a reasonable audience or become somewhat of a public figure at least an e-figure where there's maybe even hundreds of thousands of people who know who you are or hundreds of people who check out um almost everything that you say as opposed to you know most people have no audience or you maybe TikTok is that way they get a whole bunch of views and you know you don't know your imaginary friends like you know if they're just part of a TikTok algorithm or random people in china so i, mean, I think you'd have to differentiate to being in front of an actual legitimate audience and then how did you get that audience to you know now you're interacting in front of an audience that I think most people have never necessarily experienced that they've never act, interacted in front of an audience. Um, so I, I don't know if you're trying, making that differentiation to actually having an audience and then you'd have the narrative factor of, well, how do you have an audience? How did it come to be that you have an audience and now you're talking about uh, the capacity to interact in front of an audience as opposed to most people who've never had an audience? Well, I'm just talking about those who have an audience. So the, the typical thing that I will produce, uh, considering it's going out on five or six platforms, like cumulative views combined with uh, podcast you know, listens. So typical video will have you know, anywhere from 400 to you know, 1,000 or, or more uh, views or listens. So that's an audience. I'm just taking the audience for granted in, in my point. Uh, let me go on to my next point here. Yeah, Till I streamed, or like, like I never had that. Even now, like you know, I have a smaller imprint, but you get a few hundred views. And then I remember when I first started streaming, it was really you know after I met you, and then I, I you know, I was putting up videos, and some of my videos even got like a few thousand views and, and some comments, but they weren't streaming. So it just you, when you were saying that, it, you know, it's like uh, your position of privilege to uh, be talking about like you know just the presumed. Like when I talk, like I have an audience. Okay, uh, next next point. Uh, you by doing a regular live stream, you have to learn to make peace with making mistakes and not doing as well as you hope. I mean, you you're always going to be uh, somewhat frustrated by things that you forgot to say, by things you didn't phrase as eloquently as you wish. I, I know when I start a show, there are many topics I want to explore, many ideas and things, narratives that I want to develop. But as soon as I press the, the live stream button to, to go live, the technical and social demands of the show just eat away at much of my cognitive power. My conversational palette immediately narrows, you know, becomes much more compressed than what I anticipated. I have to lean much more on my notes as the ideas and narratives leave my head. I tend to not write down as many notes as would be optimal. I consistently overestimate my ability to retain ideas in my head without writing things down. So there are so many things to look after with a live show, with sound quality being number one. Uh, paying attention to one aspect of your show takes you away from other things. For example, I always try to write down timestamps on every show, but when I'm doing that, I'm not paying attention to anything else. I'm not paying as much attention to listening. I can't be speaking while I'm writing down timestamps. So one way that doing a live stream can make you a better man is that you have to make peace with your imperfection and the imperfection of creating something like a live stream with its multiple demands. Any thoughts? Yeah, just as you were saying that, I, I was remembering why I lived in Manhattan and I had my you know, rapper friend roommate. And you know, that, that was towards the advent like facebook just came out during that period like in effect it, it it was even before facebook came out and uh you know maybe there was a myspace or something but he would spend an inordinate amount of time practicing his rhymes and we also had like a big mirror and like he would spend like hours just staring at himself in the mirror and sometimes we would both be there and we would both just kind of like stare at ourselves in front of the mirror and i was more doing like self-reflection like who am i um although you know he was you know, had rhymes, he was trying to become famous, he was doing pickup artistry, you know, maybe, you know, God forbid, even some drug dealing. And, um, but he was constantly rehearsing and testing things. And then he would go out and try it. He would go to the clubs and he would, uh, you know, because he was a musician and had rhymes and he'd have to, he worked at it, he perfected it. And also his pickup artistry game that he uh, was always working on, on his uh, pickup artistry game. And, you know, so that was before the advent of this technology. And, you know, presumably in Hollywood, uh, you know, that's, everyone did that. 
in, but now the application of this technology um, may be superior to just uh, practicing in front of a mirror. I don't know if you know. You obviously you're old enough to uh, you, whether you did it yourself to uh, you practice in front of a mirror. And so even in yeshiva, like uh, you know, as people start becoming rabbis, you know, you got to practice your sermon. And uh, many times, like I've sat there for people when they practice their sermon. And, uh, you know, so just when you were saying that, it was making me go back to the old days where people did that kind of things for, uh, you know, in front of a mirror. Yeah, it's uh, it's a mirror. It's a mirror to your soul. It's a mirror to your mind, in addition to the, the physical mirror that happens when you live stream. And people notice when you're looking, you know, overweight, when you've lost weight, when you're looking uh, more buff, less buff, when you're looking healthier or sicker. So you're getting immediate feedback, you're often getting the kind of brutal feedback that you don't get from people face to face. Uh, another way that you can grow through live streaming is to, you have to recognize the reality is most people are better off, you know, without your show that other people, most people have, you know, more important priorities than your show. And that many people who are once key parts of your show, such as my show have moved on for very good reasons. So if you accept these realities, it better situate you in reality and you are much better off in life when you're at ease with reality as opposed to denying reality so any thoughts on these points yeah i always stress you know church of entropy or other the value proposition and you know i saw the guy ben thorpe uh you know he's making his rounds his daughter's getting bigger she's like you know almost co-host on the kill stream and uh you're getting you know they're like uh somewhat in the alt-right but uh you know even different uh, spheres of the internet and he had this like list of like you know supposedly people that were scared to debate him and you know i didn't have a chance to speak with him i don't even know if he would accept the feedback but it's saying like well those guys are professionally like the value proposition most of those people have moved into the period where this is what they do for a living and like you got to pay them i always stress to people like uh, the best way to get people to stream with you is to pay them. And almost no one wanted to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like most of these people that they, they, they do this, they do it for a living. And if you want them to appear in your program, the single best way to get them is just to offer them money. And, uh, but any form of the value proposition, the value to you as the streamer, the value to the listeners, the value to the people in the chat, the value to uh, your co-host and the guests. And, uh, you know, should always have that in mind. And sometimes people will do it when there's a negative value proposition. And if the value, and maybe that's some kind of like the negative Judaic attitude where you're always thinking like, it's in your best interest. Like, I know what's best for you, Goy, uh, type, you know, value propositioning. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if you think in terms of like value proposition like that, or if you think there's a Judaic characteristic to, uh, you know, thinking in terms of the value proposition. Well, I, I do think in terms of value proposition, that's recognizing that checking out a live stream is not in most people's best interest, that they should have other priorities aside from one's own production. Haven't thought about the Jewish dimension to that. Let me move on to my Well, next... just push back when you're saying like, well, I mean, God forbid, like you, we got bad programming. It's not in there. Uh, but it's saying that if the program we were making was in their best interest to watch, then they would watch. So that's like the self-improvement levels so like why is our viewership down because the value proposition has shifted and were we able to come up with a way to move the value proposition back in favor of the viewer that would be how you would gain um, viewership and saying like that's how i came onto your program the value proposition was there i wanted to hear from i wanted to hear from you know these people then on the alt-right and i wanted to hear them talking to a jew and you were the one putting that together and that's how i ended up in your audience because the value proposition was there and you know some you know like it is show business so it could be impossible to always have the value proposition in your favor well also it's the value proposition for whom so if i do a show that requires a minimum iq of 120 to benefit from or to enjoy that's a much smaller potential audience that's about five percent of the potential audience as opposed to doing a show where you only need a minimum IQ of 100 to enjoy. Uh, but there is also a good incentive for personal growth through live streaming here in that do you put the interests of the viewer at, at the forefront of your head? So is it, is it just that I want to get something off my chest 
or do I take the time to empathize with what the viewer wants and I may want to produce a show that's that has a minimum IQ of 120 to be able to access it but even then I can do a show that displays considerable empathy for the viewer even the high IQ viewer or I can do a show that demonstrates you know no empathy for the viewer it's just simply what I want to get off my chest anything you want to comment on yeah I mean you do a lot of things to make it more easy for the viewer like you I mean you timestamp a table of contents although you don't necessarily um you'll predate your programs and tell people you know like what what to expect or you know something you I mean you put a title in although it's not necessarily always what you're talking about uh, but you do considerable amount of effort to make it easier for the viewer and i think the general model for live streaming as a business model and maybe you are successful for a small period of time and i call it like the destiny model of live streaming is you get on a big platform you get enough people from that big platform over to your platform and then you just review other people's content and, and count the super chats and uh you know when you were in warski that was you know, probably what you were somewhat capable of doing like you know once you appeared there you had a lot of people who knew who you are tuned into your channel and then you could kind of just review other people's content and i call it you know, like the destiny model because he's one of the few streamers out there where you know just uh getting on his program could uh, put you in an opportunity where you have a few hundred people watching and then what are you going to do for those few hundred people you're just going to uh, review what they pay you to review and count the super chats hopefully and, and if you take off you, you uh, continue and if your audience uh you know, dwindles so I, I don't know if you agree that that's kind of the you know the generic streamer model right now of getting on a bigger platform getting those people to migrate to you and then just reviewing content right that's that's a business model that's effective and it's also a model that's reasonably effective to get views but uh, intellectual work almost never pays for itself and so if you're going to produce intellectual content it would be unrealistic to ever expect that it will pay for itself it's just not going to happen so i decided to primarily produce intellectual content on my live stream so i don't expect them to pay for themselves and, and i don't use like a destiny model or a nick fuentes model or any, any of these other models for people who are just you know pouring out moronic content yeah and then you know almost the benevolence goes like if you're so smart that you could produce intellectual content you're probably so smart to realize that like it's not a good way to make money and then kind of like, well, like you're rich, right? Like you're an old man and you're intellectual, so you're probably rich. You're not doing this to make money. And uh, which is somewhat of a reasonable presumption to, uh, you know, so a lot of the, you know, streamers, like if you're a professor, that's why I said a lot of the guys, like you just got to pay them because they're professors and they need the money and you want them to appear on your channel. You got to pay them or a lot, you know, a lot, you know, God forbid, most intellectuals uh, never actually financially uh, became wealthy. Some of them upper middle class and uh, they make their money by getting paid to appear on shows like i'm mean, even someone like paul gottfried or something i don't know i think we discussed i don't know if you ever paid guests or something like that I, i've but almost some... never almost never paid paid a guest so professors almost never get paid they are paid by the state or private institutions financing their professorships right they, they very rarely get paid for appearing on a live stream yeah, I mean, I don't think live stream would be the type thing, but I, mean, I give the, I don't know, like Paul Gottfried or something like that. Uh, if he would be an example, maybe he would be the type guy who, if you paid him, he would appear on your show. And he might, you know, like, I mean, there are a lot of uh, small time intellectuals and even the super chat model of, but saying the people are, are trying to make money at it. But then it's, you know, the paradox of, you know, like the chess players paradox, of like, oh, you're so smart. How come you're broke? and like you're, you're smart well, enough to be the greatest there, there's no paradox there intellectual life does not pay for itself that's something that's just 99.99 percent true uh those who are intellectuals and they found a way to make money it's usually because they are running some kind of con scheme where they are pretending to present you know profundity that uh, they're not really doing yeah but the andrew tate model where um you know i, I thought the i'm following him and i think the one thing that i've speculated that uh, very few people have backed up is that he is not actually that rich and that you know maybe at most he's a small-time millionaire and he may not even have that much money at all 
but uh, for his business model, he portrays it like he's extremely wealthy and he's just doing this because he wants to give back and share the information. Uh, well, meanwhile, you know, actually he's doing it because that's the main source of his uh, money. But, uh, you know, that level of intellectual content, like if, you, if you're saying like, uh, I'm doing this to give back, I'm doing it to share some of my research versus the alternative uh, motivation, like you're doing it for gain and then it turns into credibility. You know, like, uh, I mean, I think it's a reasonable thing to ask him. You, you just kind of, I mean, you gave a reasonable answer. I don't necessarily disagree with it. But I think no, the question, I don't, yeah, I don't, if, don't you're so smart, if you're so smart, how come you're not rich is actually a very reasonable question to ask. Yeah, I don't think it is because intellectual life does not pay for itself. That's just a fact of life. And so I don't uh, do live streams primarily to create credibility for myself or I forgot the other alternative. I do it because this is who I am. This is what I enjoy. So for me, this is primarily a hobby. I'm doing something I enjoy equivalent to those who paint because they like to paint or those who garden who like to garden. Well, if your credibility and okay, you have a little, I mean, you're an author, you have some accomplishments, you're, you're a known man and uh, you know, some level of Hollywood. Uh, but you said that your credibility is established outside of streaming. And then there are people who want to know about you and you're making yourself available or to put off a certain message through streaming as opposed to, um, your credibility needing to be established within the venue of streaming and you know both are possible and maybe when you you know you're as a blogger or streamer um you know you're saying your credibility is established through your real life and then the streaming is just the way you make yourself publicly available as opposed to actually trying to establish credibility through no streaming. i didn't say anything like that i said i live stream because it's something i enjoy and uh that that was my point but anyway you, you made your your point there repeatedly so let me move on to another way. Not that... in a generic you also. When I said you, I didn't. I, I meant like a generic you, like anybody who was streaming, not necessarily you. Right. Good point. Uh, so another way that you can become a better man through live streaming is that you can learn to stand on your own two feet and not need audience approval. So often on the, these live streams, I will say things that every single person in the chat will strongly disagree with. And you also constantly having to face choices of risking and possibly losing relationships for the sake of saying what you believe to be true this is a good test in life you can always cuck to save your relationships or you can make the other mistake and just heedlessly burn your relationships or you can try to steer a middle path you know valuing both your relationships and the pursuit of truth and make considered careful individual choices so learning to stand on your own two feet is one of the possible benefits to gain from live streaming avoiding audience capture and staying in integrity with what you believe to be true. Any thoughts on this, David? Yeah, I agree. Although you know, it goes back to what I was just saying before that it's from a point of privilege where you actually have an audience. Cause most people, if they stream, no one's going to listen to them. And you know, to the point where I have an audience and even if I don't cater to my audience, I still have an audience, which is a state of privilege and you know it's like generic you as a person who has credibility outside and makes themselves publicly available and you're saying well i want to make myself publicly available to do what i want not what the audience wants and the audience just in appreciation of me making myself publicly available will tune in for what i want as opposed to what uh, they want so you have to know your power level uh you know it takes a certain power level to be able to do that and uh, you could test your power level because if you your power level is not there your audience will abandon you okay i'm gonna move on any final words for today david yeah you know just before you messaged me i was reading that tablet article on like the history of the alt-right and you know if you wanted to set aside a stream it was a pretty long article and and i was disappointed because it, it didn't mention like the role the prominent role that like right-wing jews Hasidic Jews and Orthodox Jews played in it, and it and it had, you know, kind of like the 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 anti-Semitism or the racism level. Uh, but uh, if you did look at that tablet roll and wanted to go through, like, a, you know, I mean, either a memory memory lane or a, you know, a, a intellectual analysis of what that article got wrong by ignoring the role that Jews played in the uh, in formation of the alt right, I, I found that interesting. Okay, great. To be continued. Uh, thanks. Cool. Thanks, David. Yeah, have a great day. Thanks a lot. Take care. Okay, let me go to Robert Wright here talking with 
Mickey House about the special prosecutor appointed in the Joe Biden, Hunter Biden story. Impeachable, but well, the Brown. key with impeachment, it doesn't have to be a crime. Well, neither is not voting. The reason to not vote for someone. Um, so anyway, okay, so so maybe that's, the- that's heating up incredibly quickly. You have like there, there, there should be some word for like the, the, the you know Peggy Noonan just sort of said, has now pronounced it's it's a it's a real scandal. Okay, you need like two or three more figures. I was trying to I was arguing with somebody who was trying to figure out why did people take Watergate so seriously. I mean, it obsessed the nation for months. Mm-hmm. It eventually led to Nixon's impeachment. It was not as corrupt as this. Okay, as this potentially is. And and nobody cares about this, but they cared intensely about Nixon. And why was it? I think it's because the press had more credibility. People, you know, people who, who they trusted to be neutral said this is a real scandal. Nixon lied, but Biden's lied. I don't understand it. So if four or five, two or three more, four or five more people like 